We need to know one thing, and it's an important thing to suss out. Is the corporate media incompetent or are they just plain evil in the way that they frame any type of negotiation regarding social spending? Now, case in point, recently the New York Times had a fascinating lengthy piece on Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez titled, Ocasio-Cortez isn't wavering, are New Yorkers on her side? And the sub headline there is, by voting no on the infrastructure bill, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez set off a fierce debate, including among city residents eager to see the subways improved. Now, Representative Ocasio-Cortez was one of the progressive lawmakers who did the right thing in refusing to vote in favor of the corporate handout bill, also known as the bipartisan infrastructure bill. That was the bill that was promoted by the US Chamber of Commerce. That was the bill that received support among Republicans in both the Senate and the House, 19 in the Senate, 13 in the House. And it was great to see AOC stay true to what her promise was along with other members of the squad, by the way, because the whole point was that progressives would vote in favor of the bipartisan infrastructure bill if and only if there was passage of Biden's Build Back Better agenda, which has all the social spending in it. All of the provisions that progressives of course prioritize, but more importantly would benefit the lives of constituents that these lawmakers represent. Now, the context of course is important, but the New York Times didn't get into the context. They didn't get into the context regarding how corporate Democrats, certainly corporate Democrats like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema in the Senate didn't hold up their side of the promise or their side of the deal. They were supposed to go along with the reconciliation bill as long as they got passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. They didn't hold true to their promises. But that context was missing in this piece. Instead, get a load of the framing that you'll come away with as you read this story. Here's what the lead was. This is the first paragraph in their story. As the number six train, subway train, as the number six subway train uh, creaked toward an elevated Bronx station on Tuesday, one of Representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's constituents stood across the street struggling to understand his Congresswoman's opposition to the most sweeping public works legislation in generations. Then they move on and say the infrastructure bill, which passed the House last week, offers New York billions of dollars. And it was a top priority for President Biden, congressional Democrats, and even 13 Republicans, four of them from New York. This is the third paragraph, yet Ocasio-Cortez and five fellow progressives voted against it. They argued that the bill was too modest and sought to use their votes to pressure wavering moderates to support a bigger climate and social safety net bill that is pending. No mention of corporate Democrats and how they failed to fulfill their side of the deal. No mention about any of the context that's relevant in informing AOC's decision to vote against that legislation. Now, again, those are the three paragraphs in the very beginning of the article. There's also no mention about how the bipartisan infrastructure bill includes provisions that would actually be incredibly unpopular with AOC's constituents. Provisions, for instance, that would allow for the privatization of public infrastructure, which means that corporations would be managing that infrastructure and of course would be implementing tolls and fees that Americans would have to pay as they're getting to and from work. No mention of that provision at all by the New York Times. They also didn't get into an analysis in regard to how exactly the bipartisan infrastructure bill would benefit AOC's constituents. They vaguely mentioned spending for public transportation. They vaguely mentioned a number, billions of dollars. Now remember, the bipartisan infrastructure bill only allocated about $550 billion in new spending. So what portion of that is going to help New Yorkers with their public transit system? Like New York Times doesn't get into any of that. But they did just kind of vaguely talk about it or write about it as if it would overwhelmingly benefit the lives of New Yorkers. Okay, I mean, it's not true. There are certainly huge issues with the bill, but they didn't get into that. Now, they love to cite anecdotal evidence for how 
AOC's decision to vote against the bipartisan bill is incredibly unpopular in her district, so unpopular. Now, did they provide a representative poll to make that point? Because you know, a representative poll of the constituents in that district would give you a better idea of whether or not her constituents disagree with her decision. They didn't do that. But they're like, oh, let's just find let's just find some people in New York in this district who didn't like her vote. And they gave the example of um, Emmett Ellen Allen, um, who says this, right mindset, speaking about AOC's decision, but wrong execution. And there were other comments like that sprinkled throughout the article. But again, anecdotal evidence is not the same as maybe having a representative poll that shows how constituents in that district really feel. Nonetheless, the other paragraph that I wanted to draw attention to is where they write that even in her New York City district, perceived as one of the most liberal in the nation, there are sharp disagreements unfolding over how far left the party should go and how change is best achieved according to interviews Get this, with more than a dozen constituents, elected officials and party leaders. Oh, Fascinating, so what portion, what percentage of the dozen or three dozen people that you talk to um, represent her constituents? Because there's a lot of people mixed in that group of interviews. You've got some constituents, but then you have you know, um, elected officials and party leaders. I'm guessing elected officials and party leaders who have probably been pretty transparent about the fact that they can't stand the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. But we don't get any details about the specific individuals that they interviewed here. Let me give you more though. They blame her, they blame AOC for being divisive. They don't mention Joe Manchin, they don't mention Kirsten Sinema. They don't mention the fact that Cinema would literally run away from her own constituents as they're trying to ask questions about legislation that she purported to support. And now all of a sudden has completely abandoned her base on. They didn't get into that. They didn't talk about how divisive that was, but they did talk about how divisive AOC is, allegedly. That she's divisive, she's the, ba- she's the big baddie. She's the one who denied corporations or tried to deny corporations those sweet, sweet government contracts. How dare she? But let me give you more. They finally provide a positive comment about AOC in the fifth paragraph, no. The 10th paragraph, no. 15th paragraph, no. They waited until the 16th paragraph of the article to provide a positive comment. On AOC. And it comes from um, an assemblyman, uh, Zoran uh, Kwame, who says this All I've heard across the district has been support for the decision that she made. A lot of that is based on the fact that she was elected on the promise of fighting for more than the crumbs we've been told to accept. And he's absolutely right about that. And then my favorite part about this piece is how the New York Times decides to conflate. AOC's constituents with the business community, going so far as to include the Chamber of Commerce in the same sentence as her constituents. Here's it, here it is. They write, some constituents, business leaders and elected officials say that day to day she is not always accessible. Ideology sometimes has to go out the window when it comes to bringing home the bacon, says Thomas Gresh. The chief executive of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce, who said he has never been able to successfully schedule a meeting with the Congresswoman. By the way, that speaks very highly of AOC. Look, I will criticize AOC when I think she deserves the critique. Uh, Not taking up a meeting with the head or the VP of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce is something I can get behind. Go ahead and cry more, Grish. But I'll give you more from this piece. Again, there's no mention of how Manchin and Cinema didn't uphold their part of the deal. All the blame was on AOC and how she's so, so bad, so bad, so naughty for not voting in favor of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. There was again, no explanation or analysis of what's even in the bipartisan infrastructure deal and how it would be so great for its constituents, right? No mention of that. And so the real question here, and I want to ask you guys, because this isn't the first time that we've talked about it this week. 
the media's framing on progressives versus the corporate wing of the Democratic Party. We've seen it happen time and time again. So the real question is, and we have a poll on this, tyt.com slash polls. Is the New York Times incompetent or evil in the way that they've been covering the story? And by the way, I wanna give you another example. This isn't necessarily about the New York Times specifically, but we have noticed something very specific in the way the cable news networks are reporting on the Build Back Better agenda, on inflation. Remember, we shared a story with you regarding former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, who I'm not a massive fan of, but he has been raising alarm over inflation in our economy. But the way that the media was reporting on it literally twisted his words, right? They, they put words in his mouth when according to the op-ed he wrote this week in the Washington Post, this is what he, he, he thinks the solution needs to be in response to inflation. He writes, let's not compound errors that have already been made with far too much fiscal stimulus. He's talking about the Federal Reserve here and overly easy monetary policy by rejecting Build Back Better. The legislation would spend less than 10 years than was spent on stimulus in 2021. Because that spending is offset by revenue increases and because it includes measures such as childcare that will increase the economy's capacity. Build Back Better will have only a negligible impact on inflation. So. Larry Summers is being very clear there. He's saying, look, I'm not saying that the solution or the response to inflation should be to kill the Build Back Better agenda. But if you watch cable news, they'll tell you a different story. They'll put words in Summers' mouth. Just watch. Summers, he pointed this week to the $1.9 trillion American rescue plan that was passed earlier this year. In March, he said that's a major reason behind the rising inflation, something he called at the time, quote, the least responsible macroeconomic policy we've had in the last 40 years. Is it possible that Americans are suffering now from high prices because the Biden administration overstimulated the economy with all of this money going into the economy? Uh, the inflation thing is so real that everybody acknowledges it now. And of course, it's not just Republicans. I mean, Larry Summers has, um, has worried about it openly and Joe Manchin uh, worries about it quite rightly. And um, the, the problem uh, Joe Biden has is that it's going to affect uh, the passage of Build Back Better. They've already created a lot of harm this year with the previous $2 trillion package they passed earlier this year without a single Republican vote. It created raging inflation, which Larry Summers, the last honest Democrat in town, admitted was going to happen, predicted was going to happen. So the best way to sum up the impact of this package, if the Democrats pass it, and of course it'll be all by themselves, is they double down on all of the mistakes they've already made this year. Yeah, well, I thought you put it well. I mean, uh, and Larry Summers deserves a lot of credit. Larry Summers deserves a lot of credit, unless you actually read his op-ed and noticed that he doesn't want to kill uh, the social spending bill. That he's actually blaming inflation on the behavior that we're seeing from the Federal Reserve. You know, cheap money in the economy allows for private equity to borrow at near zero interest rates and invest that money in uh, real estate, single family homes which has inflated housing prices, and that spilled over into the rental market as well. They didn't get into that because it seems like, I could be wrong, but it seems like the corporate media has an agenda here. For me, if I were to answer that poll, it seems like they're intentionally taking Larry Summers' words and twisting them in order to fit a pro-corporate anti-social spending narrative. And in the case of the New York Times, to leave out so much critical context in their reporting on AOC's actions. I mean, it just shows you everything that they really stand for, who they really stand for, what they protect in this country. It isn't policy to benefit your lives. It isn't social spending to materially improve your lives. What they seem to wanna to protect is corporate interests and the US Chamber of Commerce. And if AOC and other progressives refuse to play ball in providing government contracts and handouts to corporations, because corporations love that kind of welfare, well, they're being baddies. They're being very naughty, according to the New York Times. Absolutely pathetic.
Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.